So um, I think we're going to begin the hearing a few minutes early because um, uh, there will be uh, votes around 10.30 or 10.40, and they may take about a half an hour or so. So I'm trying to get as much as we can um, done in the beginning, and then um, we will reconvene after votes. But I figure I might as well, I might as well start uh, just a few minutes early uh, to give more time for our witnesses. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Uh, I join with my colleague and co-chair, Randy Hulkren, and welcoming, you, welcoming all of you to this Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission uh, hearing on peace and victims' rights in Colombia. I extend a special welcome to our witnesses, three of whom have traveled from Colombia and another from Notre Dame uh, uh, to be with us today. I also want to recognize the Latin America Working Group, Oxfam America, and the Washington Office on Latin America for their unceasing efforts to support human rights, peace, and democracy in Colombia and elsewhere in the Americas. In November 2016, after four long years of negotiations, the Colombian government signed a peace accord with the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, known as the FARC. It is a comprehensive accord that goes far beyond the demobilization, disarmament, and, reintegra and reintegration of former guerrilla fighters. There are sections on rural reform, political participation, ending the illicit drug economy, dismantling paramilitary organizations, and fulfilling victims' rights. It's an accord that recognizes that peace is more than the cessation of hostilities, that putting down arms is the first step, not the last. The constructing, uh, that, that constructing peace requires dealing with the root causes of the conflict that, that last, has lasted over 50 years. Importantly, it is also an accord that placed the suffering and rights of victims at the center of the agreement. Today, we are here to look at the implementation of the peace accord, the process of translating what's on paper into practice. We're doing this now for a couple of reasons. First, a new government is about to come into power. The, Iv Ivan Duque was elected in June will take the oath of office on August 7th. So this is a good time to take stock. But second, we're worried. Uh, there has been a lot of pushback against the accord from important sectors of Colombian society. Uh, you may know that a referendum called on the first version of the peace accord was voted down. And there are ongoing efforts in the Colombian Congress to change some key negotiated provisions. Meanwhile, after dropping uh, for a few years, coca production has increased dramatically in Colombia. Whatever the reasons, this matters because far too many people in the United States government, uh, for, uh, for, I, I should say for far too many people in the United States government, the main concern about Colombia is controlling the flow of drugs into the United States. Increased coca production puts bipartisan support for peace uh, in Colombia at risk. And last but not least, we are here because people are still being killed. Social leaders, human rights defenders, and demobilized guerrillas are being assassinated left and right, as many as 311 since January 2016, according to the Human Rights Ombudsman's Office. There is fear that we've been here before. Colombia has been racked by internal armed conflict for most of its history. The current peace process with the FARC is the latest of many such accords over many years with many different insurgent groups. Three decades ago, in the period before and after the peace negotiations that led to Colombia's landmark 1991 constitution, there was a massive wave of assassinations. Hundreds of people, perhaps thousands, including elected leaders, were brutally killed in a terror campaign to exterminate the Patriotic Union political party. The consequences for Colombian democracy were incalculable, and accountability for the slaughter has been, min has been minimal. So when a respected nonpartisan civil society organization like Indipaz documents 123 assassinations of social leaders and human rights defenders just since last January, people rightly fear a return to a brutal, not so distant past. This brings us to victims' rights. The eight million victims of Colombia's internal armed conflict are overwhelmingly civilians. It's civilians who have been killed, disappeared, raped, tortured and forcibly, forcibly displaced, 
far more than armed combatants on either side. Under international law, victims have rights. Rights to the truth, rights to justice, rights to reparations, and rights to a guarantee of non-reoccurrence, meaning the violence against them will not be repeated, that it will once and for all end so that peace may take hold. As President Santos has often said, the peace accord was written to take these rights into account. It sets up a truth commission, a special unit to search for the disappeared, and a transitional justice process for those responsible for abuses. There is particular attention paid to women and to indigenous and Afro-descendant populations. On paper, there's plenty to work with. I would go further. The rural, rural, reform, the rural reform envisioned in the accord, the guarantees of political participation, and the full dismantling of paramilitary organizations are all incredibly important for transforming the idea of non-reoccurrence non into reality. But again, the question is really about what's happening on the ground. Is Colombia's infamous cycle of impunity being broken? Are people able to speak their minds, organize, protest, participate in politics without being gunned down? Are people able to support the peace accords and press for its full implementation without putting their lives in danger? Because if not, there is no peace. There won't, be, there won't be a chance to build it. And any thought of non-reoccurrence, of breaking and ending the cycle of violence will vanish into thin air. Now, I've spent nearly two decades fighting for peace in Colombia. I know from experience that human rights must be at the heart of peace building, not as a talking point, but as a concrete demonstrated commitment to create the conditions that allow people to live their lives freely and fully. In Colombia, its own history demands that those conditions must include ending impunity for assassinations. They must include honoring commitments to give back stolen land, ensure local control, and improve li livelihoods for rural and ethnic communities. And they must include reorganizing, I'm sorry, they must include recognizing that women are full citizens and, participates, and participants in their society who make up their own minds about their destinies. So our witnesses today will be far more eloquent than I on these issues, and I look forward to their recommendations uh, for how members of the U.S. Congress can do more to help them achieve their hope of peace. Um, some of my colleagues will be c joining me uh, on and off uh, during this hearing, but um, before we uh, introduce the witnesses, I want to ask unanimous consent to enter all the witnesses' testimonies for the record. I want to ask unanimous consent to enter the, into the record a May 29th letter to Secretary of State Pompeo from 73 members of Congress expressing urgent concern and need for greater action over the murders of Colombian human rights defenders and local social leaders. I also ask unanimous consent to enter additional statements for the record received from the Latin America Working Group, the U.S. Institute for Peace, Oxfam America, and the National Security Archive. And I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the list of human rights defenders and social leaders assassinated in this year alone, from January 4th, 2018 through July 4th, 2018, as documented by uh, Indipaz. And since I'm the chairman, without objection, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, so I want to, uh, I want to uh, introduce our distinguished panel, uh, Elise Dita is a research assistant for, Pe for the Peace Accords uh, Matrix Columbia Barometer Project at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame. She's responsible for analyzing information on the implementation of the Colombian Peace Accord as reported by th uh, 30 staff members across Colombia. Uh, Jenny uh, Neyma, N Neyme, uh, and the, is the coordinator for public advocacy at the Inter-Ecclesiastical Dialogue for Peace, DPAS. She's a native of Colombia and a member of the Mennonite Church of Colombia and has been deeply involved for years in accompanying local level peace building initiatives in communities and churches, in, uh, including 22 years spent at uh, just, just a pause. Uh, Angela Maria Escobar is the coordinator for the Network of Women Victims and Professionals, a national network dedicated to supporting the rights of women of sexual violence in Colombia. She herself was a victim of violence related to Colombia's armed conflict uh, and broke her silence in order to defend 
the rights of other women victims. She's participated in one of the women's delegations to the peace negotiations uh, uh, you know, in Havana. Uh, Luis Fernando Arias is the Secretary General for the National Indigenous Association of Colombia. During the peace negotiations in Havana, he was the leading indigenous voice uh, during the development of the ethnic chapter of the uh, agreement, and uh, we're grateful that you are here. And last but certainly not least, Adam Isaacson is the Director uh, for Defense Oversight at the Washington Lo uh, Office on Latin America, known as WOLA, monitoring USAID and advocating for peaceful resolution to Colombia's long arm conflict has led him to visit Colombia more than 70 times. Uh, before, becoming, uh, before coming to WOLA in 2018, Adam worked uh, on Latin America demilitarization at the Center for International Policy and on the Central America Demilitarization Program at the Arias Foundation for Peace and uh, Human Progress in Costa Rica. So we are grateful uh, you are all here. This is an important hearing, and I will uh, begin with Ms. Dita. And just make sure your microphone's on. Now, uh, you pre yeah, press the... the How about now? Testing. Still not. Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> Chairman McGovern, Chairman Holtgren, and distinguished members, thank you for inviting us to testify today. My name is Elise Dita, and I'm a researcher for the Peace Accords Matrix Project of the Kroc Institute for Peace Studies, which is part of the Keough School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. We have been tasked with monitoring the implementation of the Colombian Peace Agreement. My goal today is to provide the Commission with an overview of the progress and challenges to the implementation of the 578 commitments we have identified in the agreement. This focus on implementation is born out of one of the main findings of our research on other comprehensive peace agreements. Although the content of an accord is important, the best predictor of sustainable peace is the level of implementation of the commitments in an accord. At the 18th month mark, we find that compared to 34 other comprehensive peace agreements, Colombia is at an average pace of implementation. More than half of the commitments in the accord have been initiated and about one fifth have been completed. Many of these are foundational short-term measures related to ending the conflict and establishing the infrastructure for implementation. The majority of the reforms outlined in the agreement are intended to correct social inequalities and institutional deficits in Colombia. To date, progress has been slower in implementing these long-term structural reforms, including measures to address specific needs of women, Afro-Colombians, and indigenous communities. In fact, the latter commitments actually have lower levels of implementation compared to the rest of the accord. Today, I will highlight three areas where long-term structural change is a priority. Security and protection guarantees, rural reform, and justice for victims. First, security and protection guarantees for social leaders and FARC ex-combatants. Despite high levels of armed forces deployments in Colombia, there is continued violence in targeted killings. This violence, in addition to its human costs, impedes implementation of many of the Accord's core programs and poses a grave threat to the peace process in the long term. The lack of security and protection guarantees mostly affect social leaders who work with issues closely related to implementation of the Accord. In previous comprehensive peace agreement implementation processes, a lack of security in rural areas and the targeting of former combatants have had dire consequences, leading to remobilization and renewed armed conflict. Security forces must transition from a strategy of counterinsurgency to a framework of human security and community protection. Second, the Accord establishes, establishes a number of provisions for economic and social development in rural areas. Important legislative and institutional steps have been taken to start these programs, but most are still in early stages of implementation. Comparatively speaking, this slow pace is not an anomaly. In the 34 other comprehensive peace agreements we have studied, it has taken an average of seven years to see substantial progress in social and economic development reforms. 
The extended timeline required for the implementation of rural reform provisions, however, is not an argument for complacency or inaction. On the contrary, steady and consistent action is needed to advance rural reform. Finally, another key issue is establishing an extensive system for justice and victims' rights. Progress is underway in the core programs for transitional justice. And actually, generally speaking, the implementation of Colombia's transitional justice system is, is well ahead of those in other accords. That said, uh, the incoming Colombian president has stated his intention to overhaul parts of the transitional justice system, and specifically the special jurisdiction for peace. This is a concern for many actors who see these changes, especially in terms of, pri of providing justice for the LGBT community and assuring the participation of the armed forces as contrary to the spirit of the accord. In conclusion, the implementation process in Colombia is moving ahead steadily. Impor important early steps for demobilization and disarmament, political participation for FARC members, and creation of institutions and plan for plans for rural reform have been taken. However, this does not mean that success is guaranteed. On the contrary, the incoming Colombian government must address these three areas I have discussed today, among many others, in order to sustain peace and achieve development. Again, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share our work with the commission. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much. And, and before I go to our next witness, let me apologize to everybody in this room because we clearly needed a bigger room. Um, and um, so I apologize for those who have to stand. Um, uh, Ms. Neme, welcome. Just wait. Okay. Eh, muy buenos días a todos los eh, presentes y quiero trasladar un saludo y gratitud a los congresistas McGord y Holgren por haber liderado esta carta que ha visibilizado eh, la realidad de los líderes sociales hoy en día en nuestro país. Mi nombre es Jenny Neme y hago parte del diálogo intereclesial por la paz, DIPAS, que es una plataforma conformada por tres iglesias y unas eh, 13 organizaciones religiosas colombianas apoyadas por varios escenarios ecuménicos a nivel global por más de 20 años y hemos promovido la defensa de la vida y acompañamos a personas comunidades víctimas del conflicto armado y promovemos la construcción eh, de paz y la reconciliación. Desde hace unos cuatro años hemos acompañado estos procesos de conversaciones eh, y ahora de implementación de los acuerdos entre el gobierno y FARC y también hemos acompañado el proceso con el ELN. Hemos hecho veeduría al cese al fuego y al proceso de incorporación a la vida civil de los exguerrilleros y también hemos emitido varios informes. Hemos participado y conocemos de otros procesos de paz en el mundo y al observar el proceso colombiano vemos que es novedoso, profundo, va más allá del desarme y la reincorporación a la vida civil de los exguerrilleros. Creemos que este acuerdo cumple con los estándares eh, del derecho internacional de los derechos de las víctimas con garantías de debido proceso para todas las partes con el sistema integral de verdad, justicia, reparación y no repetición pero la implementación ha sido compleja. Nos duele el asesinato de más de 311 líderes sociales y las múltiples amenazas a personas y organizaciones sociales. Eh, dentro de estas amenazas a las organizaciones, varios de las organizaciones miembros de nuestra plataforma DIPAS han recibido amenazas. El fin de semana pasado una de nuestras organizaciones apareció en uno de los panfletos eh, que circuló las águilas negras y también nos preocupan hechos en los territorios como los que se ha presentado en el Curvarado, en el Chocó, donde continúan operaciones armadas eh, y que imposibilitan que los campesinos hagan reclamación de tierras. En los últimos dos años han sido asesinados 20 líderes y en noviembre y diciembre del año pasado fueron asesinados dos de ellos y recientemente uno de estos eh, líderes sociales. Nos preocupa que la Jurisdicción Especial de Paz ha sido limitada en sus competencias, 
fue eliminada la, obligatori la obligatoriedad del sometimiento de los terceros civiles intervinientes en el conflicto armado y recientemente el Congreso de la República aprobó las reglas de procedimiento limitando su ejercicio frente a eventuales extradiciones al acceso y a la validación de pruebas. Además, se incluyó una reforma constitucional para que los militares tengan una sala especial que los juzgue, compuesta por nuevos magistrados. De esta manera, se pierde la posibilidad de una rendición de cuentas de todos los actores, generando nuevos desequilibrios y quizás propiciando nuevos mecanismos de impunidad. Además de estas reformas, tanto la JEP, como la Comisión para el Esclarecimiento de la Verdad, como me los mecanismos de justicia transicional están siendo deslegitimados en la opinión pública. El Congreso no aprobó las 16 curules en la Cámara de Representantes que debían ocupar las víctimas como parte de los mecanismos de participación dispuestos en el acuerdo. La incorporación a la vida civil de los exguerrilleros ha sido deficiente especialmente en términos de seguridad jurídica, económica y social. Estas evidencias, además de las afirmaciones del actual presidente electo, Iván Duque, de corregir o modificar el acuerdo final con las FARC y de cambiar las condiciones que ha manifestado para continuar con los diálogos con el ELN, realmente nos generan preocupación. Por esto hacemos un llamado de alerta para que se actúe a favor del cumplimiento de los acuerdos, pidiendo al nuevo gobierno de Colombia y al nuevo eh, Congreso que cumplan con la totalidad de los acuerdos. Eh, queremos dejar como DIPAS una carta pastoral que hemos redactado con eh, esta información que estoy presentando y un poco más con la ampliación de la misma. Muchas gracias. Well, thank, thank you very much. Ms. Escobar, welcome. Muy buenos días. Mi nombre es Ángela María Escobar, Coordinadora Nacional de la Red de Mujeres Víctimas y Profesionales. Hacemos parte de la campaña Violencias y Otras Violencias, Saquen mi Cuerpo de la Guerra. Y he sido víctima de violencia sexual en ocasión del conflicto armado y fuera de él. Estoy acá también para colocar en este lugar la voz de las víctimas no con la pretensión de representar la diversidad de las mujeres víctimas de la violencia sexual y otras formas de violencia contra nosotras, sino con el propósito de que ustedes conozcan que a pesar y con lo que ha significado la violencia sexual en nuestras vidas, las víctimas tenemos la fuerza y la esperanza de hacer de la paz una posibilidad real en Colombia. La movilización y la incidencia de las feministas y de las organizaciones de mujeres y víctimas en la mesa del diálogo de, en La Habana marca un hecho histórico en los procesos de negociación porque se incluyeron los derechos de las mujeres, la población del LGTBI en todos los puntos del acuerdo. ¿En qué estamos a 18 meses de la firma del acuerdo? La implementación exige la voluntad política del gobierno en lo nacional y territorial, la coordinación institucional, los recursos económicos y técnicos suficientes y una amplia, plural y democrática movilización ciudadana para defender lo acordado y hacer veduría a su implementación. Algunas de las dificultades son el asesinato y amenazas a líderes y lideresas. El último informe de la Defensoría del Pueblo reveló una cifra muy dolorosa, entre el 1 de enero del 2016 y el 30 de junio de este año, 311 líderes de derechos humanos fueron asesinados en Colombia y en los últimos días se ha agravado. Un patrón que llama la atención en los casos de asesinatos contra las mujeres líderes y defensoras en el país es la suma de otras agresiones en las amenazas contra las mujeres. Suelen decirles, perras, deberían violarlas y torturarlas. Los homicidios presentados contra mujeres denotan siempre los mayores niveles de violencia, incluso la violencia sexual. La lenta implementación de los acuerdos, situación que es muy crítica en lo relacionado con los derechos humanos de las mujeres y de la población LGTBI. A la fecha, 
se han elaborado una serie de informes acerca del desarrollo de la perspectiva de género. Todo ello coincide en señalar el bajo incumplimiento aún de lo acordado en materia de los derechos de las mujeres y el enfoque de género. Tercero, en la participación política, otro de los grandes obstáculos es la fecha que no se han aprobado las curules para las víctimas. Cuarto, los graves cambios que se ha venido dando en el sistema integral de verdad, justicia, rep reparación y garantía de no repetición. Es el aspecto importante que tiene que ver con la centralidad de las víctimas. A. Ah, el cambio de reglas incluidas en la ley estatutaria de la Administración de la Justicia y la Jurisdicción Especial, G. Allí se aprobó que los responsables de violaciones con menores de 18 años en ocasión del conflicto armado sean juzgados por la G, pero la pena debe de ser impuesta por el Acuerdo Penal Colombiano. Esto significa que los responsables de estos delitos prefieran negarlos o no confesarlos, lo cual no motiva que digan la verdad, dado a que deben enfrentar la misma pena por dentro o fuera de la G. B. La inclusión del procedimiento de una sala especial para la investigación, el juzgamiento de miembros de la Fuerza Pública responsables de delitos cometidos con ocasión del conflicto armado, con el argumento de beneficiar los intereses de los militares, resulta desfavorable para ellos, abre la puerta a, a la Corte Penal Internacional. Además, la ley del procedimiento se le se eliminó todas las referencias de la población del LGTBI. Recomendaciones. Solicitamos al Congreso de los Estados Unidos y a su gobierno a instar al presidente Duque y a su administración. Primero, a dar cumplimiento en la totalidad de los acuerdos en su plan marco, manteniendo en el centro las víctimas y el sistema integral de justicia, reparación y garantía de no repetición. Segundo, que se ponga en marcha a mayor brevedad, el programa de garantías y protección para el ejercicio de la política y se brinde seguridad a los líderes y las lideresas sociales. Tercero, al desmantelamiento de los grupos paramilitares y los grupos ilegales armados que atentan contra los derechos humanos de los y las habitantes en los territorios. Cuarto, destinar los recursos suficientes para implementar el acuerdo. Quinto, que el Congreso de los Estados Unidos y su gobierno continúe con la asistencia para la implementación del acuerdo y la construcción de la paz. Sexto, hacer un llamado al Congreso de los Estados Unidos para que haga un, un seguimiento a la situación de los derechos humanos de las mujeres y el cumplimiento del acuerdo en materia de los derechos de las mujeres víctimas. Muchas gracias. So, thank you. So, I think we're going to take a little a break because I've got th three minutes to vote. Um, and um, and I, I, this, this may be... Uh, it might be up to 30 minutes here, so I, I do, I, I. Hey, again, I ap apologize um, uh, for the interruption, but there will be no more interruptions. Uh, so now we turn to Mr. Arias. especially for representing the government. First of all, I want to send on behalf of all of the indigenous people of Colombia and especially the Colombian ethnic for the Okay. How is is this going to be better for you? Okay. Lo siento, me estaba diciendo que tenía que hablar en voz más alta porque no me oía. And secondly, I want to give you thanks for having this space here to testify before the Commission about the situation in Colombia and specifically about the ethnic groups in this country. Unfortunately, this time around, I have to say that the col situation in Colombia is just as serious and complex as it was, despite the fact that in November of 2016, we have signed peace accords. After that date, more than 300 murders have been registered and 68 murders in indigenous leaders during this period of time. 21 of them in the first quarter of this year. Paramilitary groups, which have been strengthened, are responsible, as well as members 
of security forces, public security forces, and also of gangs that still exist in Colombia. This situation, which has shown a serious humanitarian crisis, and we have asked the Colombian state and also are asking for your support that one, we need to strengthen self-defense mechanism. We started a campaign with the Attorney General of the Nation, something called Lidera La Vida, to vis make more visible the lives of social leaders. And these are going to be leaders who are women, environmentalists, Afro-Colombians, and indigenous leaders. We have seen them affected by the violence in our country. But we've also requested the strengthening of protection mechanisms like the indigenous and Cimarrona guards, which are part of the ethnic section of the peace accords. Secondly, especially in front of, especially when it comes to political sectors close to the government who have announced that they are not as committed to the peace accords as we'd like, because that worries us because of violence. We're worried that sectors of the democratic sector are going to have a referendum to finish with the judicial protections in the peace accords. And we're also concerned that we're going to go back to glyphosate fumigation, which in the past, in under the framework of Plan Colombia was a failure and they for them to use this strategy. We have to implement what is in the peace accords, especially when it comes to comprehensive rural reform. And also point three, which is a plan of substituting illicit production. And we want to ask the US and Representative McGovern to help us go back and make sure that we do not have glyphosate used to win because we've seen that this is very dangerous for human life and also for the environment. We are also concerned that in Colombia, we've seen a rise again in paramilitarism, especially because of the support of political sectors. It seems to us also important to send a message to the new government that we need to keep negotiation with the National Liberation Army and we need to have a bilateral ceasefire as soon as possible so that we can have participation from the uh, citizenry and we can also move forward with this process of transformation so necessary in Colombia. We also, we also would like to request from this honorable commission support to implement the ethnic chapter, which is, you can see in this booklet, which we're going to give you, so that also part of the congressional record, this is something related to the indigenous and Afro-Colombians. It's part of their efforts. We need to have an intercultural and ethnic focus when it comes to implementation of this agreement. In the previous year, we have established 86 goals, which are measures to see if the implementation of the peace accords is going to plan. And so we're asking all of the support and cooperation from the Congress on what is inside of this chapter. The specific points that should need to be developed in the next decade in Colombia. And we also estimated, Representative McGovern, that the relationship with indigenous and Afro-Colombian peoples be direct, which we have also 
presented to USID in Colombia and also here because we want to strengthen our political processes and our organizational processes. Finally, we want to thank you for all of the support and solidarity that we have had during all of these years from you with Colombia and especially with indigenous and Afro-Colombian peoples, which have been the main victims of the armed conflict in Colombia. Thank you. Thank you very much for your excellent testimony. And now, uh, last but not least, uh, Adam Isaacson. Thank you, Congressman McGovern, and thank you, um, uh, Ch Chairman McGovern, I should say, and, and Chairman Holcren for creating this space. Um, it's such a key moment to have uh, a place in the Congress where uh, my colleagues from Colombia can talk about what's happening in the country right now. And, and it is a crucial moment because it's a hopeful moment. I mean, Colombia is down to just two armed groups with national reach, the ELN and the Urabeños paramilitary group. The biggest one by far, the FARC, turned in its weapons just over a year ago in a very orderly process involving the United Nations. And without <coughs> an armed FARC, I mean, Colombia has done away with the big obstacle to its political and economic development. And it's also without, it's done away with what was a pretext for not getting at some of the bigger obstacles, like inequality, corruption, and impunity. But there's still some real reasons to be concerned here. I mean, my colleagues have talked about the attacks on uh, social leaders and human rights defenders. Since the beginning of 2016, one has been killed every three days. And so far this year, one has been killed every two days. And in the last month, it's just about daily. It is intensifying. Um, the compliance with commitments in the accords is way too slow. Coca in Colombia, there's about two and a half times as much coca planted in the country as there was in 2013. And there's a lot of uncertainty about what the next government is going to do. But still, the peace accord offers a respite, a chance to focus on solving larger problems without this emergency atmosphere of, ar of an armed conflict. And the accords also offer sort of a roadmap for how to do it. And just as far as US policy, <coughs> I, I want to talk about five sort of principles that we can follow. I mean, first, let's focus more on rural areas. Less than a quarter of Colombia lives in rural areas, but that's where most of the coca is. It's where most of the conflict really affected people's lives. It's where most of the social leaders are being killed right now. And it's hard to sort of convey how absent the government is from most of rural Colombia. You can go 200 <coughs> miles from Bogota and find places where there's so little currency even that people use crumbs of coca paste on a scale to buy things in stores. One in six people lives off the electric grid. There's no such thing as land titles. And as long as that happens, we're in danger of a reversion of conflict. The Peace Accord's first chapter on rural development offers a plan. <coughs> it's focused on about 15% of counties in the country. And it's a long list of investments, making up about 85% of the cost of complying with the accord. But that's moving too slow. In those counties, homicides are up 32% so far this year. The law to implement Chapter 1 hasn't even been introduced yet. It's not clear whether it's going to be. Um, fulfilling that chapter is not a giveaway to the FARC. It's what Colombia needs to do to make its countryside viable. USAID knows this and has been um, putting a lot of its $180 million a year uh, that goes to Colombia into rural of development, but the needs are just enormous. Second, this accord, or rather this, our US policy really needs to focus on the victims. More than one in every six Colombians has registered with the government since 2011 as a victim of the conflict. The negotiators in Havana <laughs> said that this process will put victims at the center. But while these killings of social leaders continue, those are just words. The United States can help here. Our diplomats need to speak out more in public about what's happening. They need to show up in person with some of the threatened leaders and show support for their work more often. Um, we can increase assistance for protection programs. We can increase assistance for prosecutors and investigators who are trying to get at the masterminds of these killings. We can also keep supporting the Accord's ethnic chapter, um, which is promoting a differentiated approach to the implementation of the talks. Third, really all roads here lead through the justice system, whether you're trying to get at who's killing the social leaders, whether you're making the transitional justice system work for war criminals, corruption investigations, dismantling organized crime around the country, setting settling land disputes, even protecting US investments, you're not going to deal with any of this if your prosecutors and courts are weak, politicized, underfunded, or hobbled by corruption. <laughs> now, Colombia's justice system is probably in better shape than a lot of Latin America's. They've been through this crucible of the Medellin and Cali cartels and many scandals, but they're not through it yet. They need judges and prosecutors and investigators need physical protection. They need personnel to reduce caseloads. They need equipment, infrastructure, even transportation, and, and the United States can help. 
Fourth, let's not get in our own way with the material support provision. What this means is that uh, there are 13,000 former FARC fighters free to go around the country, floating around the country. They're practicing politics in many cases as a political party. The overwhelming majority of them appear to have left crime and violence behind. And of those, a majority are not accused of serious war crimes. But under Section 2339A of Title 18 U.S. Code, if the U.S. government, just imagine the U.S. government is funding a development meeting in, in, in one part of Colombia. Uh, <coughs> the government is talking with the community about what, what to, where to invest. And one of these 13,000 people shows up and eats a sandwich at a coffee break that the United States paid for. You have then violated this pr uh, prohibition on material support to terrorists because the former FARC are still on the U.S. terrorist list. They're probably going to be on the terrorist list for a while, but we need a common sense approach so that we know that our aid workers and their implementers are not actually aiding terrorism, which of course they're not. Uh, we need more flexibility. Fifth, let's, there is an emergency next door in Venezuela. Coca growing is out of control. We're going to have to deal with those, but we cannot let that distract us from this key moment in Colombia and the opportunity it provides. We have to walk and chew gum. Walking and chew gum, chewing gum is going to mean more money or at least maintaining current aid levels for, for a while. But hey, we spent $10 billion assisting Colombia during the worst of its conflict. This is no time to draw that down. We've got to keep it in place and let it be guided by the, at least these five principles. And with that, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for, the, uh, for, your, for your testimony. And um, I mean, it's, it's very enlightening. Um, let me just say, before we get into questions, that um, you know, I, th I think the uh, the uh, the peace accord is an extraordinary document, um, and the whole process that led to it was quite extraordinary. It wasn't easy, um, and a lot of different actors had a fight to have a place at the table. Um, I'm sure it's not perfect, but nothing in this world is perfect. Uh, but it is a good roadmap, as Mr. Isaacson said, uh, and. Um, but, it needs, but the test is whether it will be implemented. I had spent a lot of time uh, when I was a congressional aide uh, uh, in El Salvador during the 1980s uh, fighting for peace in that country. Uh, and they did get a peace accord. And I th naively thought that that meant that we were on the way to better days. Uh, I was wrong uh, because even though there was a peace accord, um, people were not uh, in engaged enough in its implementation and making sure that uh, the necessary investments were there from the international community and the accountability was there and dealing with issues of impunity uh, were, were dealt with. And, um, you know, in the United States, uh, government that supported the Salvadoran government and the Salvadoran military with countless dollars um, kind of walked away. I mean, not all together, but the investment and the commitment was nowhere near what it was during the war. Uh, and here we are all these years later, and El Salvador is one of the most violent places in the world. Um, the war is technically over, but more people are being killed each day in El Salvador than were being killed each day during the war. Um, and so I look at the Colombia Peace Accords you know, as you know, as a way to kind of be a model uh, to the extent that they're implemented to say this is how you do it. And if you implement these accords and you do this right, you're going to have peace, you're going to have prosperity, uh, you're going to have respect for the rule of law. Um, everybody's going to be respected, uh, and. Um, and that, that's my hope, but I, I will be, one of the reasons why we're doing these hearings is because we're still hopeful, but we're worried. Um, you know, Ms. Uh, Ms. Dita, you mentioned in passing that the Institute has done research on the implementation of other comprehensive peace agreements. Has that research examined the role of political will on, uh, on the part of the implementing governments? Um, you know, has it looked at the role of popular support for the agreements being implemented? and? And if so, what were your findings? Because, and the reason why I ask that is because it seems to me we're at the point now where political will is essential. You know, that this is doable, um, but if the political will is not there, then the investments aren't going to be there, then the accountability is not going to be there, and this isn't going to work. So I'd be curious to, 
your response to that question? Uh, perhaps, yeah. perhaps two parts um, or two examples to answer your question. Uh, first, our comparative research shows that in the election immediately following the s signature of a peace agreement, it's often um, a group closely associated with conflict actors that is elected. Right. Um, so that may seem surprising, but perhaps um, the, the people we know <laughs> are less scary than, than an unknown in, in those kind of situations. Um, so it's not abnormal that... Um, the Centro Democrático candidate was elected. However, and also maybe surprisingly, the second government, so the government elected after the peace agreement, often has higher levels of implementation of the peace, ag peace agreement. So counterintuitively, they continue even if they were against the peace agreement. That nece doesn't necessarily have to do with political will. Um, it more has to do with momentum. Uh, so if enough institutions and legislation is put in place uh, before the present the the new government comes um, into power it's a little bit easier uh, to continue with that momentum so that's a call for the Colombian government in the next uh, few months to continue um, with this momentum of implementation a second um, example and per perhaps a more concerning one, often it's not necessary to completely overhaal the accord um, as, the, as the, the incoming president has suggested. Uh, you simply can defund and um, deprioritize the implementation of the accord and the institutions involved. A good example is Bangladesh. Um, there was an internal conflict with um, some minority ethnic groups. The peace accord created a specific ministry for these ethnic groups, um, which worked at first, but a new administration came in and simply filled the ministry with people from the majority ethnic <laughs> ethnic group, and, and nothing, uh, the ministry became completely ineffective. Um, so we would encourage civil society groups to watch those quieter ways of not implementing peace agreements, so defunding, deprioritizing, uh, simply not... Um, paying attention to what was agreed upon in the accord. So you note that the, the Peace Accord Matrix Project will be submitting a new report this month to, the Col to Colombian officials. Can you describe the nature of, of your dialogue with the, with the government? Uh, you know, along with your findings, do you provide recommendations to the Colombian government, uh, to international donors? And uh, you speak about momentum. I mean, do you think the Colombian government is, is generating the momentum necessary? And the reason why I ask, um, was the last time I was in Colombia was less than a year ago. Um, and uh, again, I give President Santos a great deal of credit for championing these peace accords. But I got the impression that, um, in, that, that, that some felt that he felt his job was done. You know, that it's up to the next administration to do the implementation, which I thought was unfortunate because I think that gets to your point of momentum. It kind of slows the momentum, but I'd be curious to your response. Um, so our report is comprehensive and provides implementation data on the six points of the accord that we've mentioned here um, and looks at about 578 commitments um, in order to look both at what's going well and on um, gaps and possible negative cascading effects. Um, so negative momentum, I guess we could call that. Um, and yes, we do include advice in our report. Our first report was actually quite positive um, because the first step in any agreement is creating the legislation um, and the institutional infrastructure needed to um, implement the accord. And we've seen a lot of that. There's crop substitution programs, there's initiation of the special jurisdiction for peace, um, initiation of territorial planning processes for development. Um, so though it's easy to want everything to happen at once, it, it's simply not possible and those beginning foundational steps are essential. This right now, our second report, report will encourage um, lawmakers to see this as a critical time when momentum could stop. Laws have been created, institutions have been created, but now becomes the hard work of implementing in the territories where 
Um, and I think there, a lot of my co-presenters have already spoken about the need to encourage participation um, in, in local territories. Um, yeah. For the passage of the special peace voting district right. law and continued participatory processes. Before I yield to my colleague, uh, Mr. Hulkren, um, so when I was there a little less than a year ago, we went to a place called Norte de Cauca, am I, am I, yeah. and, um, and what was striking to me was that this was a community in rural, rural areas uh, where there had been a FARC presence in the past um, that was very excited about the peace accord, the ethnic chapter of the peace accord in particular, um, who were planning amongst themselves, you know, um, priorities uh, for, the, for their communities, whether it was infrastructure priorities, they were talking about crop substitution, um, you know, that the, they wanted to not grow coca, they wanted to do something else, they had ideas. Um, and what was frustrating was that it seemed like nobody from the government was paying attention. They were complaining that nobody was actually showing up they had sent appeals to Bogota asking for, you know, I mean, for engagement. Um, and um, and, I, and what, was, what was particularly, what bothered me was that you know, this excitement and this commitment to actually doing things differently and this hope could easily disintegrate if, if they don't get a response. I, I had seen coca fields over my many, over the many times I've traveled to Colombia in the past, in this area, I've never seen so many coca fields in my life, um, and um, and it wasn't just people who were involved uh, uh, with this in the past. Uh, there were new players coming from outside, you know, taking advantage uh, of kind of the vacuum that was created, and um, and you and you know, there was coca fields everywhere. In fact, there was. We saw one that was like a stone's throw from where there was a military installation. Um, so I, that's I mean I, I, that's the stuff I, I'm I'm really worried about is that I yeah the, yeah we have the crop substitution and we have all these you know great but it's like you know like is it happening um, and is it happening and I know things can't all happen immediately but it it just seems that the longer time goes on and people are not listened to the more people are going to give up hope and think that. This is this isn't worth it. But and Ava, let me let me yield to my colleague, uh, Mr. Holker, if he has any opening remarks. Thank you. Apologize for busy day with a lot of uh, hearings and meetings, but uh, uh, grateful again for all of you and for your work. Uh, I also want to thank my good friend and, and co-chair Jim McGovern for bringing this important topic to the commission today. In the wake of 50 years of violent internal conflict, conflict in Colombia, the world welcomed a comprehensive and victim-centered peace accord signed and ratified in 2016 between the Colombian government and the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC. Over the course of the conflict, it is estimated that over 6 million people were forcibly displaced, 50,000 uh, had disappeared, and 26,000 were victims of sexual violence. In short, the Colombian government has assessed that 8.6 million people, or 18% of Colombia's population, were victims of this conflict. The peace talks were revolutionary because they sought to address the grievances of victims on both sides of the conflict by involving some of those victims, and particularly women, in the negotiation process. After four years of negotiations, the talks led to a variety of solutions aimed at victims' re redress, including the disarming of the FARC, the launching of the transitional uh, justice uh, program opening, judicial proceedings against those who committed gross human rights violations and war crimes. The first cases to be addressed by judges began this month and include cases against members of the FARC, members of the Armed Forces of Colombia, civil servants, and civilians. The peace accord is groundbreaking and is moving in the right direction, but still has a long way to go before full impl implementation is achieved. In the midst of the recent political changes in Colombia, we urge the new administration to earnestly continue to implement the agreement despite the challenges of doing so. Given the length of the conflict and the number of people affected, a peace accord of this magnitude will require strong government leadership to fulfill government promises that were made, sustain public support and political will, and the continued courage of all those Colombians who are affected by the violence and who are involved in the process of restorative justice. Lastly, I'm also very concerned by the recent uh, increase in violence against human rights defenders and social leaders in Colombia. 
Though the general homicide rate in Colombia is at historic lows, attacks against community leaders and activists rose by 30 percent between 2016 and 2017. I'd like to hear from our witnesses as to what they think accounts for this and what linkages there are between the killings of social leaders and implementation of the peace accord. I have a couple other questions as well, but I think I will start with that. Uh, if you would be willing to address, and I apologize, maybe you've already talked about this, um, but uh, if you could talk just a little bit about uh, what you think accounts for this significant increase of attacks against uh, those who are uh, fighting for uh, humanitarian rights in Colombia. And before you answer, I just want to ask unanimous consent to insert into the record, uh, while, while this hearing was going on, I just got an email that the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights uh, just issued a strong statement condemning the, uh, the murders of human rights defenders and, and social leaders. So I think that should be part of the record as well. But if any of you want to address Mr. Hulkren's uh, question, that would be, that'd be great. Let me, I'll, I'll say the question again, uh, pretty more succinctly if I could. So uh, I'd ask if any of you would, you would have uh, thoughts on uh, what you would attribute to the reported sharp rise in the number of assassinations of human rights defenders uh, in 2017 and 2018. In your view, how have the defections of various factions from the peace process and departure of others from uh, reintegration areas contributed to the rise in violence? I'll start. Thank you for the question. Um, it's, it's a few things that have happened all at once. Um, first, because of the peace accord, you've had independent leaderships pop up. All of a sudden, somebody who's a leader in their community, they have something called um, community action boards in most municipalities around the country, uh, and they're not suddenly not tied to any armed group. They've suddenly emerged, and that makes them vulnerable if they're not protected. You've got vacuums that are not being filled. The FARC actually did pull back from a lot of areas. And it's sort of the same effect that you'd have if the military had suddenly pushed out an armed group from an area, but the government didn't fill the vacuum quickly enough. And new groups or factions of those groups have come in and those independent leaderships are very vulnerable. In some cases, landowners or people doing land grabs are going after people who are trying to get their land back or who are actually there. And in many cases, the competition is over narco-trafficking. If you've followed Mexico, you've seen areas of Mexico where you've got, you look at a map of a state and there's just like a dozen different groups competing. You're starting to see that now that the FARC, which had dominated a lot of these areas, is now pulled out and uh, people are getting caught in the middle. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry. I would like to complement what Adam just said. There are a number of reasons. There's not a single reason for the increase in murders of social leaders in Colombia. I'd like to tell you some of those reasons. Are you in Chile? Testing, testing? Okay. <laughs> okay. So there are a number of reasons, not just a single reason. I would like to um, talk about some of them. First of all, the territories that used to be controlled by the FARC and that had the presence of the FARC. Now they're under dispute. There are different kinds of actors in the conflict that are trying to control the areas. I'm talking about paramilitary groups, the ELN, cartels, and so they are trying, they're competing for control over drug trafficking, for illegal mining, and the all of the business that has to do with criminality and illegality. And so what this means is that the communities are in the middle of an armed conflict, and especially social leaders. They are the primary target of these uh, military actors because they're trying to control the territory. Another reason is associated with the process of land restitution and territorial rights because many of the leaders that have been murdered have also had their lands taken away from them and in that process of trying to reclaim their land. Uh, during this whole time, they have been subject to murders. But something uh, is happening. In, in the case of the mega projects that are being developed in some regions, there have been more murders. For example, the people from Rio Vivo, which is an environmental organization that has been working, especially in the last 
period of time defending water in Antioquia. They are building a big dam there. Uh, a company in Medellin is building it. And a number of environmental leaders in Rio Vivo have been killed because of their environmental activism defending water and the environment there. So the reasons are uh, multiple. They're not just one reason. And what concerns us is that it seems that the situation is going to become more severe with the new government. Un saludo, congresista. Congressman Holgren, and thank you so much for having uh, made the situation of the social leaders more visible through the letter that you sponsored a few years ago. Thank you very much also uh, for giving us the opportunity to talk about the reality in the country. I agree with my colleagues. I believe that many organizations, uh, even before the signing of the peace accords, had already raised an alert. And we had said as the FARC began to reintegrate into civil life, the areas that were under their control were going to be left unprotected. And so these areas were occupied by a number of different armed groups, and that has created confrontations and has left the population there in a high level of vulnerability and danger. This, uh, we had said that this was going to happen, it has occurred, and now we are witnesses of these murders. But in addition, there's a huge number of threats to social organizations, organizations that traditionally have worked defending human rights or uh, peace. I also believe that in Colombia, for many, many years now, social community leadership in the local areas has been strengthened. And it's been strengthened precisely because of reporting human rights violations, reclaiming lands, and this activism has put people at risk. Many of the people who have been murdered are people who are trying to reclaim their lands. The place in Curvarado, in Chocó, uh, there has been a historic land dispute. In the last two years, at least 20 social leaders have been murdered. Two of them between November and December last year, and another about three weeks ago. And all of this has to do with defending land, territory, and at people demanding their rights. But they're doing this in the midst of armed confrontation, and that's why they're in so much danger. In addition to the human cost of, of these lives being lost, it, the, the increase in murders of social leaders could have serious effects on the implementation of the peace agreement. At the local level, these leaders are often in, involved in multiple causes, including crop, illicit use crop substitution, victims' rights, other issues. Um, so if it becomes too dangerous to work in these important areas, we're very likely to see um, a decrease in implementation in the, in the territories, as, as you were discussing. Go ahead. Muchas gracias. Otra de las causas. Another of the causes is the right to participate in democracy. Many of these leaders have been murdered and threatened for opposing the new government. Can I ask one more question? Is that all right? Uh, just quickly, and maybe this isn't a quick answer, but uh, uh, would like to get your suggestions and thoughts. My co-chairman and I uh, feel like part of our responsibility is giving information to our other colleagues who aren't able to be here or be a part of this of what we can do. And I guess that's the question uh, I would offer out is, what do you think, how can the U.S. Congress, how can the U.S. government, the State Department, uh, other entities um, be helpful? Uh, my hope is, our hope is by talking about this and identifying this and making uh, what has been going on public, it's a little step, but we also know there's more that needs to be done and can be done. So I guess I would just ask if you have suggestions of what we can take back to our colleagues or to uh, others in government here in America to say this is really what we need to do to turn around uh, some of the uh, violence and attacks that have been happening 
uh, most recently in Colombia. So do you have any suggestions? Absolutely. Um, first, simply letters and other, you know, floor speeches, other things that uphold the labor of, of social leaders and let um, uh, the, the people in Colombia who have the power to stop this know that we're watching. Mm -hmm. um, second is, is appropriations. They're, you know, maintain the, the current levels of aid to Colombia. Focus on the judicial system. Uh, actually, focus on several uh, agencies in Colombia that have a power to, to protect. Um, the Ombudsman's Office has done an amazing job of pushing for this and, and, and heads an early warning system that could use more teeth. In the Interior Ministry, there is a protection unit that is actually assigning bodyguards and supposed to help respond to threats, and they could use a lot more resources and more managerial expertise, really. Um, in the, the prosecutor's office, there is a unit that is looking at this that needs all the political backing it can get and all the resources it can get in order to really get it. You know, you don't just want the guy to arrest the guy on the back of the motorcycle that pulls the trigger. You want to get at the masterminds. Um, and there you do need some sophisticated um, investigative capacity, and we can help pay for that, um, especially if there's a lack of political will in Colombia to do that. And if there is a lack of political will, Congress can certainly help, you know, prod both the State Department as well as Colombia's government directly to show more. Okay. Es fundamental. I think it's essential to maintain political cooperation with the country. And when I talk about cooperation, I mean strengthening. For example, in the case of indigenous and Afro-Colombians, it's support of the chapter of the peace accords relevant to this. We need at least 10 years to be able to fully implement what's in the agreements. I think that for us, it's an essential that we meet what it said in the plan. We cannot be changed, but it needs to be strengthened. The institutions that are included here in each of the six points. Secondly, we think that it's very important that the Colombian government adopt prevention and protection of social leaders. It's important to support the self-defense measures that the communities have. In the case of indigenous, that means strengthening the Cimarron and indigenous guards, the Cimarron being the Afro-Colombians. And this is protection of our communities and our society to be able to defend ourselves against armed actors. And that's essential. Those are our blue helmets, but with no arms to maintain life and um, control in our territories. Any others? Alguien más? Desde el diálogo in DIPAS, we have maybe 13 asks. One of them is, we request that you demand from the new government and the new Congress that they protect the final agreement and to strictly adhere to fulfilling it. We think that this is essential. We've all signed it. It's a good agreement. And it includes some very important points, and we need to move forward with it. And maybe we can also emphasize that we make all of the necessary efforts in the legislative, political, and judicial, and budgetary sectors so that these agreements move forward in the best way possible. Secondly, we are very concerned because the mission of peace of the United Nations which has the job of verifying this process and the process that's happening with the EN. This is going to end in September. And so our concern is that this peace mission is not going to continue. So we think that the opinion of the United States is going to be very important so that they recommend that this mission be extended, not just in terms of technicalities of technically a verification with everything in that has to do with the peace process in Colombia. The higher priority of the program um, guarantees 
to be able to participate in politics in protection of def human rights defenders and social leaders. Women who are defenders of human rights, for example, we felt that there's actually been an increase in sexual violence against them. The Congress of the United States and the government needs to continue with support of the implementation of this agreement and creation of peace. And, uh, more broadly than security for, yeah. security for rural communities themselves um, and in terms of Congress's message messages to the armed forces government um, and police in Colombia there's a need to move from the strategy of counterinsurgency that has prevailed for many many years to a more community focused um, strategy of policing um, and of security so um, in terms of aid and technical assistance that's an important ask Again, thank you all. Uh, grateful for your work. Thank you for being here. And we will certainly talk more of what we can do uh, together uh, to, uh, to see much of this end, uh, the violence and, and uh, killing, uh, and want good things for Colombia and the Colombian people. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Chairman thank you. Governor. Thank you. Back. I got a, a couple more questions, if, that's, if you guys are okay with that. Yeah. Um, so. I appreciate your response on, you know, kind of what the U.S. government should do. Let me let me ask you for your assessment of what the U.S. government is doing right now. Um, are, is the U.S. Embassy uh, supporting um, human rights defenders enough? Are we are we strengthening, um, uh, doing, are we, are we viewed as strengthening civil society in Colombia? Um, are, are, are we viewed as uh, fully supporting the peace accords? Um, and I just would like your assessment as to what we can do better um, in the short term as we look at these long-term goals. Um, in, in terms of programs, uh, you know, what has been appropriated to carry out programs, I think that you know USAID's portfolio has been quite supportive of, of the peace accord um, of, of ethnic communities of implementation. I think a lot of what has been done uh, to get the, the rural programs part of the accord um, set up uh, has benefited strongly from, from USAID's support. I think what's, this is kind of rare, actually. I think the, the uh, appropriations are actually ahead of the rhetoric right now. Uh, I think that the actual shows of rhetorical and public support, support in Colombia's media from U.S. diplomats and representative of the U.S. government has not really been there in the last 18 months or so. Um, you hear a lot more um, concern about the growing coca crop, which we're all concerned about, or about um, you know isolating or you know punishing Venezuela, which is also important, but not as much about the need to implement. Uh, uh, what, what about when human rights defenders are attacked or uh, leaders in uh, the ethnic communities uh, come under threat? Are we? I mean, is the U.S. Embassy? forcefully there by your side or, 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 I mean, can you go to the embassy and, and um, you know, and, and get an audience and um, get an assurance that they are <coughs> behind you or how, how we, I'm just trying to understand, like, are we, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing in the short term, in the immediate term, right? That question's more for my colleagues. I'll just say, though, about, about 10 years ago, the ambassador would go and very, very regularly visit some of the most threatened NGOs in the country and have his picture taken with them, right. and that would be in the media right. everywhere. We're not seeing that as much. Hmm. I think that I, I agree with Adam that uh, some years ago there was a lot more openness from the embassy to receive people from human rights organization and now there is less space for that it's not that they don't listen to us but before there was a higher level of action years ago there was i'd like to say uh, several things first of all i think that the support of the u.s mission in colombia has been very important but in a context of violence like what we're living through right now, it's never enough. It's never enough because 
We are facing a situation in Colombia that has been deteriorating in recent times after all of the hope and expectation that we saw during the peace process. I think that it's also important that the embassy could be with us in the actions not just in Bogota but also in the rural territories which is where we see a more complex situation. Third, I think that it's important to think of a mechanism uh, permanent consultation with social organizations, human rights organizations, against the social leaders so that we can really monitor the situation of the communities of what's happening. If the Colombian state is really taking the measures necessary to prevent a violation against social leaders, and if they're really investing the resources that the U.S. government has given to to the Colombian state for protection of these leaders and also institutional strengthening of these institutions. We need a greater dialogue. In our specific case, I have to say that in recent times we've been strengthening the relationship, not just political, but also of cooperation with the specific resources that we got at the beginning of the program with Antioca in Cuyabembe with the IPA program. But we have um, suggested to USAID and to the ambassador that we indigenous and Afro people want to have a direct and sustained cooperation so that we can strengthen our processes and that we can consolidate the strategy that we've been working on at the national level. We already had our first uh, approach with um, the embassy and Mr. Fisco, and we also requested support from organizations because we see how serious the threats to social leaders are and also how organizations are weakened from this fear that we see in the rural territories with the threats against them. And we did approach the OEM and we've also seen projects with them for the prevention of sexual violence. Mm. I mean, I mean, I should, um, oh, I am. Uh, the, the Truth Commission appears to be one of the bright notes uh, in implementing the peace accords. Uh, the commissioners have been appointed, uh, and Father Daru uh, has been named the president or chair of the commission. And I, I met Father Daru. I know Father Daru, I think, very highly of him. Uh, it has begun reaching out to victims, including um, holding regional meetings. It has requested documents from government agencies, guerrilla organizations, and even paramilitaries, and so far received positive responses. So my question is, why is the, maybe you could, I think for the record, why is the Truth Commission's work uh, important to victims' rights, uh, the guarantee of non-repetition and reconciliation, and should the United States be, uh, what, should, what should the United States be doing to offering or offering to do to support the work of the Truth Commission? Mr. Isaacson? Isaacson. Happy to start. Um, the, the Truth Commission is essential uh, to guarantee non-repetition of the conflict and uh, to really ascribing responsibility and giving the victims sort of the dignity and recognition in knowing this is what happened to you, this is why it purportedly happened, uh, to the extent possible maybe even this is where um, some of your, your, your loved ones may be, you know, buried or, or what, what actually <coughs> happened. And, and achieving that kind of closure ending this generation's old cycle of violence. Um, I think that the Truth Commission has so far has done very good outreach inside Colombia to some of the key actors that might be most skeptical. What they need, I mean, they're always gonna need resources because it's a logistically difficult mission they've got over the next three years in a country the size of Texas and California put together to get at the truth. Um, but they also need political support. There's going to be times where their work is going to inspire a lot of hostility. Um, despite the outreach they're doing, uh, they've had some strong pushback already from the of Association of Retired Military Officers, ACORE, which has accused them of being biased. 
um, a, 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 a video has been circulating on the internet in the last week or two in social media um, editing something uh, Mr. Uh, Father DeRue said to make him look like he's supporting the ELN when actually he was scolding an ELN member for having taken up arms, but just, you know, selective editing and fake news. And that kind of thing is going to keep happening. So it's important that the United States keeps signaling that we're on their side. What about in terms of sharing information? I mean, I, I, so, uh, you know, we are, we, we, the Truth Commission in El Salvador, uh, I think was a very positive uh, development, um, but um, the fact of the matter is the United States, because of our long involvement in El Salvador, um, had gathered lots of intelligence. Um, we operated very closely with the military. We knew things, right? We still know things. I mean, we have a very close, we've had a close relationship with the Colombian government and the, supported the Colombian military. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not saying that, you know, there are all these bombshells out there, but I, I, I guess the question is, is whether or not our intelligence agencies and our State Department and, um, you know, our, uh, you know, are sharing uh, appropriate information with the Truth Commission um, to help them be able to do their job. I mean, to the extent that we have anything that's useful, we ought to, we ought to make sure we're sharing uh, so that people can know the truth. And because I think, as we all know, it's hard to get beyond conflicts um, if people don't know what happened to their loved ones. Uh, it's not that people are looking for somebody to go to jail forever. Um, it's that they want to know the truth. Um, you know, we're working on a project in El Salvador right now, um, you know, that the government has finally gotten behind, which we appreciate, to try to help locate people who have been disappeared. Um, and uh, we did a forum in El Salvador um, not too long ago and uh, at the University of Central America and it was packed with people who um, you know who wanted to know what happened to their loved ones uh, you know who disappeared in the 1980s and it was not just their immediate relatives their brothers or their sisters or their mothers or their fathers um, it was their you know it was you know grandchildren and nephews who weren't even born when they were disappeared, but you know this this doesn't go away, and the and, and and it reminded me of how important the truth is to be able to move forward, um, because if people don't know the truth, they'll continue to to be these conflicts and lack of trust and a, a view that impunity still, you know, is. Uh, is is commonplace so um but uh in any event i know you wanted to thing that we need to do with the Truth Commission is to support it in its mission and give all of the political support that it needs. Because we're very concerned about the security even of the members of the Truth Commission. The things that have happened in the last week against Father Francisco de Aru because of the right wing in Colombia show that it's a very, very complex situation because there are a lot of people who don't want the truth to be known. So I think we have to protect and care for the Truth Commission and give all of the political support that you can to this commission. In second place, we're very interested, for example, in having you support a dialogue process and a consultation process about what the methodology is going to be uh, implemented in the territories by the Truth Commission especially in indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities. We've had the first dialogue with them, and we have uh, made our proposals, but we also understand that the Truth Commission has some economic limitations if that you can support uh, budget-wise. That would be very important as well. And why do we say this? We say this because people in the territories are afraid. They are very afraid. It's not going to be easy for people to talk about some things, things that they need to say 
things that they need to talk about. So because we had a very serious conflict in the territory. So in the case of the ethnic groups, it an intercultural methodology that's appropriate for the social and cultural and organizational realities of the area so that we don't have even more uh, ruptures in the communities that have come out of the war. This is very important for us. We think that both the victims and the entire Colombian society need to know the truth. And that's what guarantees the non-repetition, the non-recurrence. I would like to point out that the Truth Commission and also the Special Jurisdiction for Peace and the Unit for Looking for Disappeared Persons, which are the three mechanisms that are part of the comprehensive system for truth, justice, and reparations, and non-recurrence, all of these are essential. It's important to strengthen the three groups. I agree with the reading that there has been an effort to uh, bring down the credibility of these organizations and to try to limit their operations. I think it's very important that the system function and the function through these mechanisms. As a platform of churches, we also believe that there is an important focus that should be restorative. Sui generis has been very important in other peace processes. It needs to be defended and strengthened. We're concerned by the economic limitations um, to the operations of these organizations. Right now, the most vulnerable is the unit for searching for disappeared people. They need to have their economic resources guaranteed so that they can function. And I also believe that there need to be security guarantees, not just for people who are working in these agencies, but especially for the victims who are using the systems. And you mentioned also the important uh, example of El Salvador in terms of technical support. I think it's very important to learn from the experience of other countries and how these mechanisms work and so that it can really be effective. Salvador is one of the fastest, had one of the fastest truth commissions ever. So already at 18 months, as you were noting, they had a, a report completed. Um, so I think there probably is uh, things to learn from that case. I'd also echo Jenny in stating that it's important to look at the whole transitional justice system together. So as she was mentioning, there are serious concerns about the funding for the unit for the search for disappeared people. Um, and we generally find that um, isolated transitional justice um, <coughs> actors, so just the Truth Commission or just the, the tribunals, aren't that effective on their own. We see more success when, the, when there's a combined um, synergy among all of those organizations. No. Um, we, we unfortunately don't have this, we're already a little bit over time in terms of the time we have this room, but I just I want to close and then give everybody an opportunity to say whatever you want to say that I didn't ask. Um, but, but here, here's, here's, a, here's the deal. I mean, this commission here is very much committed to these peace accords. There are, there's, a bi, there's a bipartisan group in Congress who believe that these peace accords ought to be implemented, and we are following very, very closely. There's a bipartisan group in this Congress that is horrified over the increase in violence against human rights defenders, against leaders of social movements, uh, against, against leaders of ethnic organizations, um, and we are watching that very, very closely. Um, we want to see, you know, the peace accords implemented. We want to see peace with the ELN as well. Um, and we want to find ways to be able to encourage that. We support the Truth Commission. We support Father Daru. Um, and anybody who is, you know, seeking truth, who comes under threat, we want to know about. Um, because we want to have their back. Uh, this is important. We want to get this right. And if Colombia gets this right, it's a win, 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 win for everybody. Um, I mean, it, 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 it not only ends the conflict, uh, but it opens up all kinds of possibilities for every sector in Colombia, including the business community. 
Um, you know, people are more likely to invest in Colombia if they don't think it's a violent place. Um, I have no idea what to expect from the next president. Um, I'm concerned, but we're going to have to wait and see. Uh, but um, I think the Colombian government needs to know, the current government and the government that will be, um, that um, there are many of us here in Congress uh, that want to see progress, do not want to see Colombia go backwards. Um, and um, people of Colombia have suffered too much. I've been there many, many times. Um, and I've always said that, you know, when people talk about playing Colombia, I, I always said that it should, we, we, should, uh, we shouldn't have a plan Colombia, we should have a plan Colombia for victims. Because there are so many victims, you know, in urban areas, in rural areas, I mean, in every community in Colombia. People have suffered enough. Um, and so, I mean, the reason why we're doing this hearing is because, you know, we want to move beyond that. And to our, our friends from, who have traveled here from Colombia, thank you for your work. Thank you for your courage. I can, get a, I can sit here and say whatever I want, um, and nothing's going to happen to me. Uh, you have to go home. Um, and, you know, the realities that you face are very, very different than the realities I face. I don't know whether I would have the courage that you have uh, to be able to speak out on these issues, but I'm grateful that you are, and we are paying very close attention to everything that you are saying here today, and we want to continue this collaboration. So I will, that, I will, that, that is all I want to say, but I, I want to go through the, if there's anything that you want to say for the record that you haven't said, uh, you can have this opportunity and, um, you know, to make some closing remarks. And um, Ms. Dita, why don't we begin, begin with you and we'll work our way all the, the way down. But again, thank you for being here. Um, two things. First, I think it's important to recognize the work of human rights leaders and social leaders for decades in Colombia right. and remember that the implementation of this peace agreement is one important, but part, just a part of peace building in Colombia. Um, so recognize the incredible efforts that have been going on for years. Uh, and second, for the new government in Colombia and for perhaps for anyone else who is not so interested in the implementation of this agreement, I think it's important to remember that comparatively, implementing a peace agreement benefits everyone. Right. It leads to higher levels of economic and social development and also to a lower likelihood of a return to armed conflict. Thank you. Same way. La guerra. Also, like to reinforce two aspects. One is to consider this an early warning. We want to uh, talk about the risks to the implementation of the accord and really cons uh, continue uh, demanding that the government of Colombia and the legislature of Colombia continue to c comply with these accords. And your support will be uh, crucial. The second is, is we just wanted to thank you and to c encourage you to continue to accompany us and to, uh, to uh, amplify the reports and the denunciations that we're making because if often these kinds of things are not known publicly and you can amplify uh, not only the denunciations but the need to take corresponding measures. We have always said in Colombia we haven't had a pedagogy for peace. There was a lot of disinformation. And now we are also asking for help uh, on the teaching about the system of truth, justice, reparations, and guarantee of non-recurrence. We n know that in all of the points of the accords, the victims are present. And so support so that the system, comprehensive system for truth and justice can function and the special jurisdiction for peace would function would be very important. In the first place, 
I'm so glad to know of your support, and I would like to ask you to continue with that support of the peace accords and especially the implementation of the peace accords. We can't, from any point of view, return to the violence that we had before. That's not even a possibility that anyone could want that. And I believe that the advocacy of the U.S. Congress with the Colombian government is going to be very important. We cannot allow the peace accords, uh, as uh, President Santos said, that we cannot allow it to be burned up in the oven. We need a, a stable and lasting peace, and we need a complete peace. And that's why we also hope that the process with the ELN will be able to make process progress. In second place, Representative McGovern, we want to invite you once again to our country to accompany us in our territories where social leaders have been killed, to send a very strong message from Colombia to all of the actors in conflict, to send a message to the government and to everyone involved that we have your support and solidarity. And we in the Ethnic Commission will certainly be glad to organize your visit. Thank you very much. Uh, finally, I mean, Colombia is about to inaugurate a new government, a new president who really made his name and whose party made their name in the past few years leading the opposition to this peace accord. And they're about to be given the keys on August 7th to implementing the peace accord. I, I'm not worried that he's going to suddenly just tear up the accord and do things that would send tens of thousands of guerrillas back out into the countryside to rearm. I'm more worried that he's going to slow walk it, not completely fund it, uh, let a lot of it just sort of fade away. Um, and that would be a tragically lost opportunity. Hopefully we can help make uh, the new government understand that this accord, most of this accord, is not a giveaway. It's not even doesn't have much to do with the FARC. <coughs> it commits the Colombian government to doing things that governments do anyway, providing public goods from security to development uh, to protection uh, for people who would like to be local leaders. Um, so it's an opportunity to invest. There is still a window open to do that, to get to these territories that haven't known a government for the first time and get there without having to shoot your way in. That window will remain open. It is definitely closing, but it will remain open largely thanks to people like the ones I'm honored to be sharing this table with, uh, uh, an organized, vibrant civil society. Um, they are under threat right now, and we must keep here from Washington do everything within our power to allow them to do their work. Thank you. Well, thank you, and, and as I said, we, we, will, we, uh, we, we want to be wind at your back. Um, and, um, you know, and, and this is a, a, a little bit of a critique of the United States government, um, but not only under this administration, but also under previous administrations. And that is so much of our focus on Latin America tends to be on drugs and immigration. And, um, you know, and, and those are important issues. Uh, but, um, but respect for human rights, peace, um, expanded opportunities, there, that increases stability in the region. Uh, and it also deals with issues of immigration uh, and illegal drugs. And the bottom line is if we can help people in Colombia tra transition um, into, uh, with, uh, into legal crops, that is a good thing. If we can help them, you know, with infrastructure so that people who live in rural areas can actually earn a living, that's a good thing. Um, you know, if we could help alleviate the violence, more people will want to invest and everybody lives a better life. Uh, so, yeah, the, I, I get it. So much of the discussion up here, we, we, we you know, we focus, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about what's happening on our border right now. It's, it's all immigration, immigration. Well, you know what? If you want to know what's happening at our border, we need to understand what's happening in countries like El Salvador and Honduras. Um, and similarly, you know, if we want to understand, you know, uh, some of the things that we're concerned about in Colombia, you need to understand what's happening in Colombia. And I think, you know, human rights ought to be at the forefront of our foreign policy. That if we stand for anything in this country, we should stand out loud and four square for human rights. So I appreciate your testimony and I look forward to continuing uh, a dialogue and uh, this hearing has come to a close. Thank you.